We've been looking forward to this weekend for months, actually. We had a, our committee, our community uh, connect committee, and we were trying to decide what do we want to convey this weekend? When we invite all of you to come into the sanctuary for this weekend where we're going to talk about prophecy, what, what do we want to convey? And the main message we want to convey is that there's peace in the midst of chaos. Speaking of chaos, I can't get, Mark, is it there? Is it, is it hooked up in the back? Okay. Anybody enjoy watching news here? Wars, we see them all around the world. People being killed, bombings, chemical warfare, natural disasters. Here in Florida, we're no strangers to huge hurricanes, completely destructive hurricanes, killing people, destroying property. I just got off the phone with my parents in Lincoln, Nebraska. You can look it up on news. Huge tornadoes all around Lincoln, Nebraska right now as they, they've sounded a bit flustered. Natural disasters, more and more tornadoes. We see famines. Did you know that nine million People die still in the world every year from lack of food. Nine million. Even though we have so much wealth in this world, still people dying from just not having enough to eat. Sickness, death. Every week, I'm a pastor here at this church, for those of you who are visitors. Every week, dealing with church members, people that I hear about, finding out diagnoses of cancer, having strokes, heart attacks, heart disease. All the time. It's, it's a world of chaos. And as I talk to people, and as these new generations are growing up, we're finding that more and more people are anxious. They look around the world and they think, what's going on? What can we trust? Where can we turn to? Who, who, who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to politicians? Can the politicians save us if we go to Washington, D.C., or the European Union in Brussels, or different countries? Can, can they legislate and make everything okay? How about entertainers? Many people worship at, at, the, at concerts and venues of where they get entertained. And somehow it does give us a little bit of relief as we just forget about the, the cares of this world and we get entertained for a while. But, but do they give us lasting happiness or do we always need to buy another album or watch another series? How about philosophy? Turning to the philosophers. Maybe we just need to understand and develop our brains more. Maybe the educators, maybe if we just get more educated, and maybe if we just, just figure out things more and become smarter, then maybe we'll be happy. Some of us, and I'm one of these people that have done this in my life, try to forget about what's going on and we just get involved in games, sports stars, all the different leagues. We've got 24-7 sports channels. You can listen to people talk about sports literally every waking hour of the day. And you can forget about some of the other more sober things going on in life. Tonight, in your pews, you have Bibles. Many of us don't carry around paper Bibles. You might have it on your phone. But I want to ask you the question, can we trust the Bible tonight? Is that where we should be looking for answers? Instead of looking at the world and the entertainers and politicians and the philosophers and the educators, could we find the answers to life's greatest questions in Scripture? You know, as I look at Scripture, did you know that more cop there are more copies of the Bible than any other ancient manuscript, and it's not even close. Homer's Iliad, they have 643 manuscripts that they know of, of Homer's Iliad. Did you know how many ancient manuscripts they found of the Bible? Over 5,600. That means that people all throughout the ages, I'm going to propose to you tonight that there have been 
People throughout the ages who have realized in this world that this is where we should be turning to for our hope and our comfort. And did you know that when they kept these manuscripts alive, that there's over 99% agreement over thousands of years of keeping the Bible alive for each generation? There are 66 books in this book, 40 different authors. And yet we will find that they agree on the great themes of life. Yeah, there are a few details here and there where there's some discrepancies. But when you look at a topic and you take that topic and you look from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you find agreement in what the Bible teaches. And even in history, in archaeology, we're finding uh, evidence of the stories that the Bible tells. Now, I'm not going to go into that, but I want to propose to you tonight. I lived eight, seven years in the former Soviet Union. How many of you remember growing up during the Cold War when, you know, doing those nuclear drills, hiding under your desk, always being afraid of that big, bad, atheistic go the government over there? Well, I lived there for, for seven years. I actually, my wife grew up in this atheistic government. She's from Russia. And I had a picture there you can see of Red Square and they would parade their military might and they said, we are an atheistic government. There is no God. We are going to live by reason and we're going to bring peace and happiness to everybody. Well, I put a picture up here of my friend, my friend Artur Shatvarov. We were walking in Tbilisi, Georgia, Republic of Georgia, which used to be a Soviet uh, satellite. We were walking one day, and I asked Artur, because he was a fellow pastor with me, and I said, I asked him, Artur, how, how did you become a pastor? He said, you know what, Doug, I was an atheist. I was an avowed atheist. I thought this book was just a bunch of old tales. I thought it was just maybe some moral stories, some parables, but I didn't think it was anything authoritative. I didn't think we should pay attention to it. I didn't want to hear about it. I had no desire to study it. I said, yeah, but Artur, you're a pastor now. How did that happen? And he said, well... I read Daniel 2, and I heard a sermon on the second chapter of Daniel, and I realized that this is the authoritative word of God to mankind. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Daniel chapter 2. It's on page 625 of your pew Bible if you want to follow along or if you have a phone, or if you just want to look at the screen, that's fine. But we are going to dig into this story because we are talking about not having peace. Artur found he didn't have peace. And when he came to Christ, when he came to the Bible and started to read it for himself, he had so much peace, he decided to dedicate his whole life to the God who he found in these pages. So we're going to tell this story, a story of King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest kings to ever live. If you've read anything about Saddam Hussein, you know that Saddam Hussein actually idolized this King Nebuchadnezzar. But in this chapter, we are finding that Nebuchadnezzar is representative of humanity and that Nebuchadnezzar has no peace. He had a dream one night, more like a nightmare, actually, and and sleep, he was deprived of sleep because he couldn't figure out what this dream was about. And the story in Daniel chapter 2 starts like this. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Have you ever had a sleepless night? Where you lie there awake at night thinking about things that are going to be going on in your life. And what could happen and this might happen and that might happen. Nebuchadnezzar could not sleep. Sleep had left him. He was bothered by this dream. His spirit was shaken. He didn't understand what was going on. So where did he turn to? He brought in what was called in the story the Chaldeans. These are the magicians, the astrologers. These are the wise men of Babylon. They're from all different countries. They were the ones that could cast demons. They would cast spells upon people. They were the astrologers. They would go out and look at the stars and try to figure out the future. These were the smartest, most educated people in the whole realm of Babylon. 
So if he was going to turn everywhere, this is why I ask you the question, where should we turn? Nebuchadnezzar knew where he turned. He employed these gentlemen. He called them in because they were the smartest people around. And he said, they must have the answers to what is troubling me. So he called them in. And this is what Daniel 2, 2 through 4 says. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, which was the language of business of the Babylonian Empire. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However... If you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Well, how would you feel if you were one of those Chaldeans? You have the best education of anybody around. You're supposed to be the one with the answers. And the king who employs you and has the power to do what he just said he was going to do to you if you can't give him the answer he wants, and that's cut you in pieces and destroy your property and kill you, you better figure out what to do. Well, they answered the king and they said this. Let the king tell his servants a dream. And then we will give the interpretation. The king answered, and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. That is, you see what he's saying. Buck up. Quit, quit this crazy excuse business. I, I'm asking you to do something. You don't talk back to me. I'm the king, right? If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree to you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream... And I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. Put yourself in the place. Sometimes we read stories of the Bible. I, this is why we dig into the Bible. This is why we, we want to come and see what does the Bible say instead of just a cursory reading. Put yourselves in the place of these most educated people in this whole kingdom. And they are being told to do something that they're looking at each other and thinking, huh, what? Who can do that? The Bible tells us, for you, God, alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Knowing people's minds and what they're thinking and their motives and the dreams they have at night is not human's business. We can't know it. And these gentlemen uh, in Babylon were figuring this out, that there's no way, there's no human way that they can do what King Nebuchadnezzar is asking them to do. And these, this is what they say. This is a difficult thing. That's, uh, how about an understatement? This is a, a difficult thing that the king requests. And there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. This becomes the theme for all Bible prophecy. This is why we study this. This is why my friend Artur was so amazed. Because this is the secular mind. What you are asking us to do is impossible. Not just difficult. It's impossible. Only a God would be able to do this. But there is not a God who lives with us who, who would do this for us. Do you see what they're saying? They were in a hopeless situation. If you want to talk about somebody not having hope, it was these gentlemen who were the Chaldeans, the wisest men of Babylon. Because their gods don't give them answers, they don't live with them, and they're being asked something to do that only a divine being could do. Well, you would think this might touch a chord of sympathy, right, with Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says just the opposite. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Oops.
Talk about hopeless. You're going to lose your life. Because this one raging madman king is asking you to do something that's absolutely humanly impossible. Hopeless. And this is where Daniel enters the story. If you remember Daniel, and if you haven't read Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was a young Hebrew boy, probably 16, 17, or 18 years old. He was from a leading family of Jerusalem. He had been taken the 1,500, about 1,000 miles from Jerusalem when Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And he was taken about 1,000 miles by foot to Babylon. Because he was so smart, he and his friends, they were good-looking, young, healthy, smart kids. They put him in, they educated him, and they got put in with this whole lot of the wise men. And chapter 1 had ended, before we got into this story, saying that they were ten times wiser than all of the rest of the people in Babylon. So, of course, who do you think the other wise men in Babylon would want to get a little bit of input from? So can you imagine Daniel, a young boy, a Hebrew slave basically, serving in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar, gets a knock at his door, and they say, Daniel, you need to come. Why? What's wrong? Something's very wrong. You really need to come because you're about to die. I just got here. I'm just part of this group of people, and I'm going to die? also hopeless. Daniel could have fallen into depression, discouragement. Well, why did God allow this? Get, be taken a, as a slave from my home, brought to this foreign land, and then I, I get promoted. I, in chapter one, I was the wisest guy around, and, and the king is going to use me for a service, and now I'm going to die? For what? I'm sure they told him the story. Well, this is what the king said. So Daniel said, I need to go see the king. Verse 16, so Daniel went in, asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. You see, Daniel has hope. He doesn't get discouraged. He understands the situation may look hopeless at the moment, but he has something that the other Wise men in Babylon don't, and that's a belief that he serves a God who does live with flesh, who does make his dwelling with humans. So Daniel does this. You can read about it. He gets his three friends that we met and that, that you can read about in chapter one that were interested in their diet and they were interested in being faithful to God. But they get together and they're all part of this wise men group. So this isn't just a, a haphazard, half-hearted prayer. This is a full-throated prayer to the God of heaven. Please help us. Why would you send us here to die? Especially with this crazy request of the king. And so they fast and they pray. Just like they, they are used to doing evidently. Because they're religious and they believe that God will answer their prayers. And we see the first key for all of us as we approach this book. If we don't approach this book with prayer... It will never be unlocked for us. It'll just be a history book, a literature book, a moral book of where you can gain some moral education. But it will never be a live, living document. And Daniel and his three friends realize that the God they serve does draw near to people. And because of their belief in that, because of their hope that God will answer them, they pray. And they ask God to give them wisdom to be able to understand why this is happening and to be able to help them get out of this situation to give them hope. And guess what? God answered and gave them the interpretation and the dream. 
Daniel answered in the presence of the king. He goes back into the king after having this time for prayer and for fasting. He goes right back to King Nebuchadnezzar. And can you imagine the scene and all the other wise men of how they were waiting with bated breath to figure out what was going to happen as Daniel's going back into this king, really one of the greatest kings in all, in all the history of the world. So this is a very momentous time, even if you look at, at the development of our, edu- uh, of our civilization. This is a momentous time, and here is this young Hebrew lad who is a servant being called back in to the king. And he goes into the king and he says this, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But, but... There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Can you imagine the king, Nebuchadnezzar? Hmm, really? Young kid from Jerusalem? All right, take a shot. Let's see what you got. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. And its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The king probably is maybe stroking his beard, thinking about it. Daniel has told him what he believes the vision was. All the wise men of Babylon were probably standing around with, again, bated breath, not, not wanting to think, oh my goodness, I hope he's right. Their lives were at stake. Their hopes were pinned on this young Hebrew boy who served the God of the Hebrews. You could hear a pin drop. Nebuchadnezzar leans forward That was it. That's what I saw. But what does it mean? Oh, the wise men of Babylon. We live another day. (laughs) Meaning better be good. Daniel continues. You, O king, are a king of kings. You see, God doesn't give prophecy and not help people that want to understand it to not understand it. He says, you, king, are a king of kings. That is, you rule over a large area of the world. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, wherever they live, he has made you head over them all. You are the head of gold. Well, that certainly was a convenient way to start the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar's probably buttons are popping off of his chest now. Wow, I'm this head of gold. All right. The wise men of Babylon are looking around. Woo, this is good. You know, we were really going to be saved now. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't know this at the time, but Babylon was going to rule. He was going to die some of his... Uh, sons and grandsons would, would take over for him. It would never be as great during his time, but it would reign until 539 B.C. And it was a fantastic kingdom. 
If you read about Babylon, it, it has captured the fancy of people through all generations. It really was a, they loved decorating things with gold. If you ever go to the museum in Berlin, you can still see the Ishtar Gate that they built in Babylon. Fantastic city, very religious city. They did believe in gods. Over 900 temples in Babylon, all over. The main one, the Ziggurat, was 300 feet high. One of the most impressive cities of antiquity. And they were very smart. You ever wondered why we have 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour? Those are Babylonian inventions. They went on a cycle of six was how they counted. And we still have retained that to this day. Very influential. It was really a kingdom of gold. But then Nebuchadnezzar was going to find out it wasn't going to last forever. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, Nebuchadnezzar. So here's a chest of silver, right? This is the uh, image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. So who would be this chest of silver? Who ended up conquering the Babylonian Empire? It was the Medes and the Persians, of whom the Persians were much stronger than the Medes. And they would rule not just for about 70 years, they would rule for over 200 years. And they would come and conquer Babylon, which, by the way, Babylon was viewed to be impregnable. No one thought Babylon could be conquered. And here, this young Hebrew lad started off the vision so well, but then he says, but after you, there will come somebody else and Babylon will be overtaken, which was hard to believe. Even the Persians, as they were attacking, they were sieging Babylon. Babylon had walls 90 feet wide. They used to have chariot races on the, around the edge of town. They had two years of food stored up in Babylon. No one thought they could beat them. All their archers and their, their mercenaries were at the top of these walls. And Persia was coming to conquer them, and, the, and no one thought they could conquer them. In fact, if you keep on reading in the book of Daniel, the Babylonians didn't even think they could be conquered. They were having a big party and getting drunk the night that they were conquered. That's how confident they were and how most people thought Babylon could never be conquered. And yet this young Hebrew lad has the audacity to say that God told him this would not last forever. It didn't. And you know what they did? Cyrus and his generals, they realized there was one weakness in Babylon and there was a river Euphrates that flowed through it. And so they dammed it off and they made another lake over there and the river Euphrates went down so low that they walked right under the bridge or the where the water usually was there at the gate and they probably had a you know chain link fence or whatever there as you can see in the artistic rendition of this and they were able just to walk in and take over the mighty city of Babylon why because God foretold it that he would allow Babylon to pass and Daniel doesn't hesitate he tells the king after you will come someone else, and that will be Persia. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, will come. Well, when we look at history, we understand that he was right. God was foretelling another kingdom would take over the Persians, and the Greeks had always wanted to overtake the Persians. You can read about all the different wars they had, but their, their, their great aspiration as a nation was to take over the Persians. And there came a man for Greece that conquered the Persians. You might remember him from history. His name was Alexander the Great. He conquered over 2 million square miles by the age of 32. In fact, he got to the ocean and he wept because there was no more land to conquer. No one could stand in front of him. And he was conquering this huge portion of the earth, just as the Bible prophecy had said. And he overtook the Persians. And he, he went through and he, uh, I always wanted to get down. I lived just north of where per Persia had its capital in Persopolis. He actually destroyed it, which should, it's not such a great ruin now because of Alexander the Great. But on his way back, interestingly enough, Alexander died in Babylon. But he left for us because all of his soldiers intermarried with every nation they went to. The Greco what ended up becoming Roman culture and Greek became this international language that was used by people all around the world of antiquity. Why? 
because the Bible said there would come another kingdom after the second kingdom, after the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel doesn't stop there. He says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. So after that, this fourth kingdom will be very strong and will shatter many nations. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. God was very distinct in revealing to Daniel that there would be this fourth kingdom of this statue that would be very strong and it would dominate other cultures of the world. Well, you might remember who came after Greece if we look at that part of the world uh, where God's people were at that time. And that was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was strong. You look and you see most historians say 476 AD was when they fell. Rome was not invaded for 650 years. That's how strong it was. It was a very, it was an iron kingdom. You didn't mess with Rome. Some runaway slaves did that once. And they, to punish them, they, they strung them up on crosses for about 100 miles you could walk. And every about 100 yards, there was another person on a cross. And they wanted everybody to know, if you mess with Rome, we'll take care of you. This was the empire that Jesus decided to come to. And it was prophesied in the book of Daniel that it would be a strong, a violent, but durable Empire. In fact, Edward Gibbon, if you, he wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, one of the uh, masterpieces really in, in um, history about the Roman Empire. He says, the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations. Anybody recognize where he might have gotten those terms from? Second chapter of Daniel, were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Where was it foretold? In Daniel chapter 2. That a mighty empire would come that would be strong. But then Daniel says, that's not the end. We're not there yet. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. What happened after Rome broke up? Some of you might see nations that you might recognize the root words of those nations. Anglo-Saxons, we happen to be speaking the language of the Anglo-Saxons tonight, the English. The Franks ended up becoming France. The Suevi, Portugal. The Visigoths became Spain. The Burgundies, settled around the region of Switzerland and Austria. The Alemanni, which, by the way, where I was living, they still refer to Germans as the Alemanni. The Lombards ended up moving down into Italy, and three of those tribes ended up disappearing from the face of history. But we see that the Roman Empire did break up, and no one was able to ever replicate what Rome had done. Now, does that mean no one tried? No, there were plenty that tried, but Daniel's vision said, wait a minute, after the strong, the legs of iron, there will be feet that are partly clay, partly iron. They appear somewhat strong, but they're brittle. They can't stay together, and they're ten toes. So there's no way that they'll ever cling together. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. Now this is interesting detail in the book of Daniel. They will mingle with the seed of men. I want you to pay attention to that phrase. But they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. It was prophesied that out of the Roman Empire would come other fairly strong countries, but they would never be able to replicate what Rome had done. And we see that has happened. And today, if you travel to modern Europe, you will see that it is not one country. There is not one language that is the, the language that everybody speaks there. It is the divided Western Empire. 
This is Queen Victoria from Britain. She was known as the grandmother of Europe. Why? At one point, she was related to every monarch in Europe. Why? They had intermarried. When I was in the former Soviet Union, I was studying about the Russian monarchy. I believe it was Nicholas II, the last Russian czar, was actually one, one, one twenty-eighth Russian. They had intermarried so much throughout the Middle Ages. Why? Because the Europeans were trying to say, we need to get along. So I'll give you my daughter. Well, okay, my son will marry this daughter. And they, they mingled the seeds of men, as the Bible said, in an attempt to unite Europe. And it never worked. In fact, you would think that if there's a grandmother of Europe, they should all get along. Well, the century after that, there were two world wars, we call them. And it was the bloodiest century in the history of Europe. World War I and World War II. The Bible said they would not mingle together. Charlemagne had tried it in the 8th century, the king of the Franks. He'd done a fairly good job, but he united a lot of Europe. But as soon as he died, his sons started fighting and they couldn't, they couldn't unite Europe. Charles V, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, he actually conquered about 1.5 million square miles, almost what Alexander the Great had. One of the strongest rulers in the history of Europe, and he wanted to squelch out the Germans and the Protestant Reformation. He never was able to do it. Why? Because the Bible said they would not cling together. Louis XIV, they called him the sun god. He was the one that actually said, the sun king, I should say. He said, I am the state. He was this incredible incredibly powerful ruler. Uh, I believe he was the one that built the Palace of Versailles. And he would, had all everything look like he could unite Europe. And yet he intervened just in Spain and they started a big war with Spain and he was never able to unite Europe. Why? Because the Bible prophesied over 2,400 years before that Amen. that Europe would never be united. Napoleon Napoleon thought he could unite Europe. He did, again, a very good job initially of conquering, if you think a good job is uniting them. But again, he took off to Russia, crossed into Russia with 500,000 soldiers and came back with less than 20,000. He was never able to unite Europe and he was exiled to an island after that. Why? Because the Bible had said Europe would never be united. Kaiser Wilhelm at the time, right before World War I and during World War I, thought that he could unite Europe and do for the Germans what others had tried to do. And actually, I didn't know this, but he actually wanted, did not want America intervening in the war. So he actually was sending telegrams to Mexico so that Mexico would invade the United States and take back the territory that they had lost from them. And the British ended up intercepting it. And Woodrow Wilson got so mad that they ended up, Americans ended up joining World War I. And within a year, the war was over and Kaiser Wilhelm and the Germans were thwarted. Why? God had prophesied Europe would not be united. Adolf Hitler then came 20 years after that, so ticked off about how Europe had treated the Germans that said he was going to make a Reich, a kingdom that would last for a thousand years, and he would overcome. And he was a godless person. This is a quote from Adolf. See, my people, we do not need anything from God. We do not ask him for anything except that he may let us alone. We want to fight our own war with our own guns without God. We want to gain our victory without the help of God. And initially, he was incredibly successful, roaring through Poland all the way into France, overtaking huge portions of Europe, and then, and then just invading the Soviet Union and having incredible success, almost getting down to the part of the Soviet Union where I was in the Caucasus in a very short amount of time. And I've read stories of of people who understood Daniel chapter 2 actually told their Nazi sergeants that they answered to, this, we will not be successful. And the Nazi sergeant said, why? God has foretold. The ten toes will never be united. No one can conquer all of Europe. People knew that had read the Bible that Adolf would never be successful. As much as he didn't want to acknowledge that he needed God, God said, you can come this far and no, from, no further. Because he'd revealed Europe would not be united. Communism tried to do it. 
Uh, I got to see up close and personal the communistic system that they had established there, the schools and the, the camps, and they were going to overtake the world and bring justice to all peoples in and, and, uh, and Europe and the rest of the world would fall in love with this theory of communism and that we're all equal and that no one will take advantage of each other. And look at what happened to the Soviet Union in a heartbeat late 80s, early 90s, fell apart. Then the European Union comes along, and if you've been keeping track of the European Union, they have some success at uniting some of the countries of Europe, but again, they don't, not every country wants to be part of the Europe. They're, well, we want to keep our currency. Do you ever wonder why can they not do it? Why wouldn't it make sense for them all to unite together to be a big, strong country and compete with China and the United States? 2,600 years ago about, God revealed to a young Hebrew boy and to a Babylonian king that Europe would never be united. But it doesn't end there, because that's kind of bad news, right? It would, some, some people, maybe Europeans, would say, well, we'd like to unite Europe, but not really, because you look at what human rulers do when they get power. And God said, I will limit these kingdoms to a certain amount of time and a certain amount of space. But then, at the end of this dream, I will show what will happen. And Daniel said, told Nebuchadnezzar this, Yes, there will be all these kingdoms after you. But in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break, into pe break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. God wanted to leave Daniel. And he wanted to leave this king with hope. When you believe in the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, the God of the Bible... He will bring in a kingdom that can never be broken and it will always be good. Matthew 25, later in the New Testament, says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And at the head of this rock will be Jesus Christ who will come back and set up his kingdom. I don't know about you, but I think God wanted in Daniel chapter 2 to show the wise men who had been in a hopeless situation, to show Nebuchadnezzar who had been in a hopeless situation and who couldn't figure out the dream that he had had this nightmare. And when even Daniel and his three friends were faced with a hopeless situation, there is hope when you serve the God of Yahweh. You see, this story is not just an ancient fable. It is a story that God told King Nebuchadnezzar and King Daniel so that you and I in Longwood, Florida, in the year 2024, can look around us and say, you know what, no matter what is going on, no matter what chaos it may seem, no matter what hopeless situation I may be facing, when I turn and I pray and I fast and I seek the God of the Bible he will give me hope. You see, in Revelation, I'm amazed that not more people study prophecy. If you look in Revelation 1, Revelation is the, the counterpart of the New Testament to the, to the book of Daniel. And in the first chapter of Revelation, it says, this is the revelation of Jesus. So for those of us who are Christians and have given our life to the Lord... This is what God wants us to see Jesus in his hand in it. And he says, if you read the words of this book and you hear them and you put them into practice, you will be blessed. You will have hope. You won't be like other nations. You will be like a Daniel in Babylon when people around him were searching for, for wisdom wherever they could find it, in the stars, in the mediums. You can turn to me and you will be much wiser and you will have hope and you will be a blessed people. Our world needs to hear that. 
need to turn from our other, other venues, things we're looking at. And we need to understand that if there should be any group of people on this planet that is happy, that has peace in their hearts, it is Bible believers who believe that this is the place where we get our hope. Now, tomorrow morning, we're going to look at the rock. Because usually we don't think of Jesus as a rock. And in this, para- in this, in this uh, chapter, Jesus is a rock that comes and destroys. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Usually we like to think of Jesus as a, a softer, more gentler Savior. So tomorrow morning, at the 9 o'clock and our 11.30 hour, we're going to get in and we're going to look at why Jesus said that we have to fall on the rock and be broken. And we're going to study that age-old, wonderful truth that started the Protestant Reformation, righteousness by faith in Jesus, and why this is a fitting symbol in Daniel chapter 2, to be the great hope of humanity, even though it destroys human governments. So come back and join us in the morning at 9 in the morning or 11.30. If you stay, come at 11.30, we'll have a lunch and we'll go into Daniel 8 and 9 when it actually tells in Daniel chapter 9 the exact year that Jesus would be crucified. Can you believe that? Daniel, a young Hebrew boy, was not only revealed the whole history of humanity, basically up until our day, but he was revealed the exact year when Jesus would come to this planet and be crucified. You won't want to miss that. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you give us these ancient words. Lord, and even though it's been over 2,500 years since Daniel had this interaction with Nebuchadnezzar. We take great joy and and we have great peace knowing that you know the end of human history and you also know that you want to give us eternal life in the kingdom that will never be destroyed. Lord, as we leave this place, may you protect us, may your angels go with us, and may you bring us back tomorrow. And may you continue throughout this weekend to give us peace. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.